Hello everyone. My name is Logan Ward and I'm an assistant scientist at Argonne National Lab. Today I'll be talking to you about a project that my team and I have been working on for the past couple years on constructing tools that make it easier to steer high performance computing campaigns uh, using machine learning. Now the core focus of our effort is on the fact that uh, computational campaigns are a wildly useful tool within scientific computing, but also one that uh, doesn't actually use high performance computing resources very well. So considering that um, these are tools that are here to stay within scientific computing, one of the pro things that my colleagues and I have been considering is how can we adapt them to make them better users of high performance computing and much more effective, uh, especially when we introduce, start to introduce exascale supercomputers. The core issue with computational campaigns is that as implemented often, they're steered predominantly by a human scientist. And typically the process goes something like this. A uh, human takes what's currently known about a scientific problem, uses that to generate some parameters for a computational campaign that they then execute on high performance computing. Now, eventually, uh, maybe hours or days later, they take the results of that computational campaign, assess them, and perhaps change the parameters of that campaign before letting it continue further. Now, this has been an effective technique uh, over the past uh, yeah, dozen or so years where it's been particularly prominent within materials engineering, but it's one that isn't going to continue to scale much further. Humans, are, in, at least in the foreseeable future, are not going to get any faster at processing data from these simulation campaigns, yet uh, supercomputers grow um, by bounds of 10 and 100 fold over the course of decades. So considering the uh, growth in high performance computing's ability to generate data, the route that we advocate for adapting computational campaigns to a, um, a even faster supercomputing uh, environment in the future is removing the human from the loop of designing these computational campaigns and instead replacing them with a autonomous agent that can quickly assess the results coming out of a computational campaign and then use them to say, change the bounds on what's being simulated or the order in which different tasks are completed. And this we hope will lead to solving scientific challenges in a much uh, more computationally efficient manner. One class of computational campaign that you may be familiar with, or at least specifically one kind of steered computational campaign are active learning approaches. Now, active learning is something that you might be familiar under the name of Bayesian optimization or optimal experimental design, is an iterative technique where one takes uh, the output of all previous experiments or simulations, uses them to train a machine learning model that is then applied to the remaining possible experiments and used to identify which ones that, if ran, would be the most uh, useful in terms of gathering more data. And active learning has been something that's been used broadly throughout the sciences already. And you can see examples on the right of how uh, my colleagues at Brookhaven have used it to fit physics models with a smaller amount of simulation data, or folks at Lawrence Berkeley have used it to find materials with useful properties at a much lower computational expense. Now, the interesting part about active learning is both the fact that it's able to solve these computational problems with much less computational effort, but that it can do all of this without a human scientist in the loop. One reason we chose active learning as an example is that it's a great way of exploring the effects of different trade-offs in steering policies. Now to illustrate that, uh, one of the challenges in active learning, especially on parallel systems, is that there are few applications which are able to scale and use an entire supercomputer, especially when you consider those which are commonly deployed in ensembles. Now, given that, you need to run more than one in parallel, and therefore, you have to make a decision about at which points do you run new computations to determine which simulations to run next. Do you wait for a batch to complete, which has the advantage of providing the maximum amount of information when you decide a new task? Or do you uh, immediately retask a 
or rerun a steering calculation as soon as the simulation completes, which ends up running the steering code more often, but keeps a larger degree of utilization. So hopefully this tra one trade-off illustrates the fact that policies are indeed important for simulations and that there's no one true policy that works best for any type of application, that you always must identify what are the challenges and the trade-offs between the computational costs of your steering program and the ensemble's uh, elements. So given that, hopefully you're convinced that there's a need for developing these steering policies. The rest of the talk will follow is illustrating how we can uh, build very complex policies using the software developed by my team, which we've named Colmena, and illustrate how we've used that to create an application that can very efficiently search for new molecules uh, using an ensemble running on over a thousand KNL nodes on ALC at ALCF. So as I promised, the first thing I'm going to discuss today is an overview of how we developed Colmena. So the first question we had when developing Colmena is what are the kinds of policy choices that we may want to develop in our steering codes? And to come up with those first, we articulated a few elements such as, well, I'll want to submit a new simulation as soon as another completes, or that I'll retrain a model after some conditions are met, like a certain number of successful simulations complete. And right away, this identifies that whatever way we def need to define our policy, it's got to have some notion of event triggering and that these events must be based on some state or sorry, that some of the actions we will employ in our policy are based on the history of the simulations. A further, a lot of our decisions involve um, retasking nodes from one type of computation to another, such as if we have nodes being used to train a machine learning model that will run to retask them to running inference tasks as soon as those models finish training. So there has still has to be some so source of resource management within this uh, policy programming. Uh, and considering that these were just techniques we came up with in like the first couple uh, years of being able to do these steered campaigns, we figure that there's probably not an exhaustive list that we could come up with during the time of our project. So really one of our core challenges was to be able to define a way of programming uh, these steering policies and writing them in a way such that these individual programs, which we call agents, uh, can react to events. They can allow these agents must be able to hold on to their own state such that they can make uh, different actions over time. And finally, uh, they need to be able to reallocate resources between different pools. And then finally, although this isn't necessarily a result of complex policies, we wanted to do all of this in a way that was decoupled from workflow uh, systems, such that you could use the same policy and different workflow engines, depending on which work best for the kind of ensemble you're running. So what we ended to come, what we ended up coming up with was effectively a three-part model for how one defines the steered computational ensembles. At one end, we have the thinking agent, which as we'll get into in a little bit more detail in the next slides, is a tool where you can use this agent-based programming method for defining how to run computations on a supercomputer. And you do that by delegating tasks to a task server uh, which uh, uses a workflow engine to execute those tasks on workers. Now, the workers eventually feed those results back through the workflow engine, which communicates them back over Redis to the thinker in order for that thinker to understand how the simulations are evolving and be able to make better decisions about what to run next. Now, the simulation, or sorry, the programming environment that we came up with for how to write these policies is based in Python. And what our Colmena library provides is a base class called base thinker that you implement to store class attributes that define any information shared amongst multiple agents. And then it defines several agents as, uh, available to that to steer an ensemble uh, using the class methods of that object. For example, and we provide a few different kinds of uh, steering agents. You could have result processing agents that say run whenever a simulation task completes. 
there could be uh, persistent agents, which we denote with this uh, general agent decorator, uh, which run during the entire life of the ensemble. And both of these are able to interact with each other using Python's threading primitives and with the supercomputer using those Redis queues to exchange information uh, or receive results. The other part of the application is the task server, where which one creates by defining um, the task to be run using, uh, in the case of parcel as a backend, Python functions that define either what computation to run on a compute node or launch an MPI process and post-process the outcome to return a result back to the thinker which you take and provide as inputs to a task server class along with a specification of the computational resources. Here, since our workflow engine is written in Parcel, we use Parcel's native uh, configuration library for defining how to use the resources. And once you have this uh, task server combined and the thinker, you start each of them and they begin to communicate with each other over Redis and then the th task server can launch tasks on the supercomputer as told by the thinker. Now, given this uh, environment for the ability to specify multiple um, intelligent agents, you can write policies um, that are able to do some complex things on a supercomputer. As an example, here I'm showing an early version of our molecular design application where we have three distinct agents. The first of which is a task ranker uh, which takes a set of uh, machine learning models from a, a library uh, shared with the other agents and uses them to run inference on molecules we have in a task queue. And once those inference tasks are complete, it reorders the task queue such that the most interesting molecules are placed first. This task queue is shared with the simulation runner, which simply submits, say, NWChem calculations to a supercomputer. And then once they are complete, stores their value in a database. Finally, we have a model updater class, which takes the latest results, uses them to update the model library. And in this way, you have three threads cooperating to take the latest information from a simulator, use it to update machine learning models that are concurrently used to select the next simulation. And within this way, these threads are coordinated. You also have some degrees of freedom in the order in which they run. For example, uh, we define this application to start by using some of the resources to run simulations even while the inference tasks were still completing. Then once the inference tasks are complete, we use the order in which the machine learning models suggest we should run those tasks. And you can see how that after about 15 minutes of simulation time, when our first inference tasks have complete, we start to evaluate molecules that are either exploratory that they were chosen to expand our design space or that they offer better properties than what we found when we were running a random guesses at first. So this way, uh, this is to illustrate with Colmena, you can write very complex software uh, that defines uh, unique policies to best use a supercomputing resource. Now to demonstrate that further, we'll go in to talk about molecular design on HPC. Now the particular application we're using is one that uh, we've been working on collaboratively with some scientists at uh, Argonne's Material Science Division for a few years, where our goal is to find molecules which serve as the energy storage medium within these so-called redox flow batteries, which are particularly promising for grid storage because they decouple the uh, energy storage from the part of the battery that is used to actually generate power. Our design problem, kind of written down formally, looks a little bit like this. Uh, we have a space of 100,000 molecules to search and can find the molecules uh, with high ionization potentials by running a combination of three different types of tasks. We could simulate a molecule uh, within WChem and use that to compute an ionization potential. I can run inference from a neural network model uh, that estimates my ionization potential, or I could run a retraining task that takes one of my machine learning models and updates it with the latest NWChem simulation results. 
And this application is something that we're targeting running on somewhere between 100 and 1,000 nodes on ALCF's Theta supercomputer. We ended up coming up with looks a little bit like that uh, early version I showed you earlier, where I have a combination of several agents, uh, which in pairs submit calculations to a supercomputer, such as the QC score, which submits NW Chem simulations, or record the results for later use. Here, I store the NW Chem results in a database. I've got three different pairs of agents. I have ones that sim perform simulations. I have others that on demand will retrain the machine learning models in my library. And then finally, I have a class of agents that will rerun inference in order to reprioritize the models in my queue. And all of these are coordinated by an allocator thread, which determines at which point each of these threads should run and how many resources they have available to them. So given these policy of interacting agents, uh, the technique, or sorry, the uh, way in which their uh, computations are ordered follows a little bit like this. And here I'm showing you a chart where the color indicates whether a node was tasked to an inference simulation or training uh, computation. And the shade uh, indicates whether those nodes are actually being used. So here at the beginning, you can see that I've tasked all of my results to, or sorry, all of my nodes to perform inference, but in fact, I only use about a third of them. Once the inference is complete for the first time, I task every node with running in WCHEM until I've completed enough simulations to warrant retraining my model, at which point I set aside a few nodes to rerun training. Once that is complete, I rerun inference over the entire space and then once I reorder my task queue, I put, give, put those nodes back in the service of running NWChem and gathering the most amount of data. And this iterates quickly, or it, where I retrain a model basically twice an hour. Our first question with taking this application was, did all of this complexity actually yield better science? And fortunately here the answer is yes. What I'm showing you is the number of molecules that we found with a high ionization potential as a function of time. And I show you three versions of the application where I gradually remove some of the complexity. In the first case, I run only, I run molecules in a random order, i.e. without any kind of machine learning. And here in five hours, I fail to find any molecules. In the second case, I do use machine learning uh, to perform inference once but I never do it again. And I use my initial uh, guess to run the rest of the simulation. And here you can see in red, I find about 100 molecules after six hours. So already immediately better or massively better than uh, random. And in gold, I show you a case where I rerun inference every couple uh, or every, a couple times an hour. And you can see that at the end of six hours, I find about 10 or 20 percent more molecules and note that this is with the same amount of allocation as this no retraining model a little bit more than random but i'm able to find even more molecules by using this complex policy that retasks nodes between different problems from here we also went on to study where our sources of underutilization are our problems are our, our major sources are easy to understand Nodes take a while to start up on a new task, especially if it involves loading TensorFlow, and we have poor utilization due to trailing tasks at the end. Now, if I dig deeper, I can see that uh, some of my other sources of latency are involved in sending large data uh, from a compute node to the thinking process. In fact, for inference, I spend about 0.6 of my time in, in communication and for training about 3%. And I can see that, in fact, sending large uh, machine learning models through the workflow engine takes about 30 seconds. So what one of my colleagues, uh, Greg Poloski, has done is built a secondary system where I more directly pass data from my thinking engine to the worker by instead of passing it through the workflow engine, I pass it through a value server, uh, which allows the two to communicate more directly. And this is shown in the figures on the right. 
allowed the inference part of our task to scale to over a thousand nodes efficiently, and it does so by dropping the amount of time spent in communication. So this wraps up my talk for today. I've shown you hopefully that uh, steering policies are going to be a uh, major route for achieving better performance of scientific ensembles and demonstrated that Colmena is a great tool for performing them. At this point, I'd like to refer you to uh, our uh, Read the Docs and GitHub page for Colmena if you'd like to use this code. And I really encourage feedback if you try using it and run into some problems. And I'd also like to thank uh, my many colleagues uh, who have helped make all of this work possible, as well as the various funding sources that have backed us. And thank you for your attention.